Deep tech is of course unique and different from, from general tech. It takes a first principles approach combined with fundamental research and a visionary ambition. These are normally technology-based uh, solutions are based on substantial scientific or engineering challenges. And they present challenges that require lengthy research and development and large capital investment before successful commercialization. So a very different ecosystem, a very different level of uh, engagement is, is required to bring this to life. And so I'm curious to hear from you why you're so excited about deep tech. What makes you think that it can really be transformative? And if there are specific trends that you're seeing that you're especially excited about. We see deep tech's potential to create what we call disruptive unit economics, which is a very fancy sounding way of saying that we have an opportunity to rewrite and recreate the way a lot of industries go about doing things. Like extraction of the lithium that will be required for 30 times more lithium ion batteries in 10 years. So hidden corners is one. Uh, you know, another is frontier areas in decarbonization that are going to be the hardest to decarbonize areas of the economy. We designed instead of a system where you bring food waste to a centralized plant, the technology so that you could take waste management to the site. It all sounds really cool and exciting. And I think the challenge when you talk particularly about technology that's hardware, technology that's big, um, your infrastructure funding and technology funding for hardware is difficult. But in the last seven years, one thing we did very differently from what we used to do before was on every single one of these infrastructure buildings we funded, we asked them to be a green building. We may not be directly funding deep tech, but for deep tech companies or deep tech entrepreneurs that they know, um, somewhere down the road, you know, potentially some philanthropists can also be uh, the customers uh, buying things as well. So I think that that could be at the other angle. It's clear that there's enormous enabling power from deep science and deep tech to improve sustainability, but also a real need to continue to support these, these innovators on a longer time horizon, more challenging market. What types of support you think are most useful to provide to these innovators today and how kind of we as a sector can crowd in and support them? That there is actually more capital sitting in U.S. family foundations, the country that I'm based in, than the entire venture capital asset class several times over and therefore is structurally more patient and risk tolerant than mainstream investment dollars might be you could do a lot of good. You could fill some very significant capital gaps. And so that was some of most of the key challenges for us were around investment capital. Um, people are interested in investing in deep tech, particularly hardware. No, every country is trying to make some effort, but the question really is where to push the button. When I think about sort of private equity versus venture capital, uh, it's already uh, very different. So how they select deals, um, the difference in risk appetite. Uh, when it comes to new solutions, uh, it would take some time. Um, and, and I think it would be great if um, the bigger size foundations can really, again, like the financial world, use a strategic sort of asset allocation kind of mentality. Do you think large philanthropies are well geared to support uh, deep tech investments and what would you change about them? I think that the core opportunity for philanthropic capital, I mean, one is just at sheer scale. We have the opportunity to think about is how we can use that um, to sort of shift asset allocation. And so if we think about the fact that there are these early stage companies that are often incredibly important sort of carriers and drivers of innovation in today's economy. I think it's really important for you to have a vision uh, and not just a short term one, but a longer one and be able to uh, uh, lay out your case. And I think that's, you know, from a receiving end, uh, that's really my experience on, you know, how to be able to do that. Uh, to take on the kind of risk and, and the more sort of unknown technology risk, I think first thing we need to do is probably just build up our own team and our own knowledge. Because, you know, uh, like, like I think, like, like we said, share in the preparation session, you know, if philanthropists are expected only to fund the value of death, then you know, it looks like you're only fun funding potentially just the losers. Right? That would not be an appealing uh, proposition to any philanthropist. 
Um, so I think you you can only invest based on knowledge and understanding. As we see these family offices, there's often a generational shift, right? So when you see a shift in generation, younger generation, probably just a different willingness and interest in trying to do things in new ways, right? Taking on what I think is, you know, the issue of our generation and the next and the next, um, but being willing to do it in different ways. There is a change that is needed within how philanthropies are functioning and engaging. If they're engaged at the level that's required, right? What the what the actual ecosystem is, is asking of them. With more flexibility, uh, more partnerships. So there's a role for big and small philanthropies in this game.